So we're seeing a rise in cases and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the speed of the increase that concerns us, right? We can't sustain a rapid rise in cases. Everyone needs to do their part because if we start losing control and just, just widespread sort of unknown uh, ongoing chains of transmission and the numbers keep going up, uh, hopefully not exponentially, that is a concern. And then, of course, related to that is sort of the, the health impacts in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if you get uh, um, more uh, individuals ending up with uh, severe symptoms and having to be hospitalized and in the, ending up in the ICU. We've seen the system go from under 100 cases, literally overnight, up to over 400. It's very concerning. Concern not just in Ontario, but right across the country today as provinces continue to report spikes in cases of COVID-19. Some provinces, they're cracking down. This week, Ontario announced new limits on social gatherings and hotspots. It posted 401 new cases today, the highest level since early June. In Quebec, police are planning to bl uh, blitz about a thousand bars and restaurants this weekend to make sure they're following the rules. So for more on the government's response to this surge, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Warner, who is a critical care physician at Michael Guerin Hospital in Toronto, and he joins us from Toronto. Doctor, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, I confess I wake up every morning and, and check the COVID cases like I used to check the forecast. Here in Ontario, it's 400 new cases today, the highest total since early June. Are you surprised by those numbers? No, I'm not surprised by those numbers. I think that in general, it was expected that case counts would increase with stage three of reopening, at least in Ontario, which uh, I believe began July 17th and then in Toronto, July 31st. And now with school reopening in much of the province, I think the case counts will continue to increase, especially as the, there aren't adequate uh, you know, safety measures within schools to make sure that uh, once cases enter schools, they don't spread uh, further. There's 401 new cases, currently 58 patients who are being hospitalized in Ontario with 20 of those in the ICU and 10 of those patients on a ventilator. You were on, on the show before a few months ago to discuss ICU capacity concerns. Are, are you worried about where ICU capacity is and, and what you're seeing with those numbers? So we have lots of beds and we never ran out of beds in the first wave, but uh, my concern uh, with this second wave is that it won't just be the number of patients that we need to care for, it's the number of healthcare workers that we have to provide the care. It's really the supply side of healthcare that I'm worried about. 97% uh, of ICU doctors in the country are under the age of 55, and many of us will have school-aged children. In fact, you know, I'm waiting my COVID test right now. I'm not able to work, and I'm approaching the 36th hour of waiting for that test result. So if there are no doctors or nurses or housekeeping staff to take care of the patients and clean the rooms, then we could be in a major problem th with respect to providing care for people once they need it. That's a challenge a, a lot of parents are facing. I mean, when you look at the testing lines that you're seeing here in Ontario and, and in other places, uh, for kids primarily, what do you make of how the Ontario government has handled this? I mean, Premier Ford has said that hopefully by next week, pharmacy testing is going to be open for asymptomatic people. But overall, where is Ontario in the testing picture? That's a great question, David, because I would ask the Premier, what is the testing strategy? Because it's definitely not clear to me. I think on June 26th, we did 33,492 tests, and yesterday we did about 35,000. Uh, stage three happened two months ago, and schools opened over the past two weeks. How could we not have the testing capacity in place to anticipate the number of tests to be required to keep kids in school and keep people working? It's, it's unfathomable to me that we're not having 100,000 tests available today. And having pharmacies do tests for asymptomatic people may fix the problem, but it won't fix the problem if lab capacity is the issue. In fact, it, it will enhance the problem because then labs will be having to take samples from more locations, and it became, becomes a logistical nightmare. It's not clear to me what the problem or problems are because no one has stood up at the microphone and told Ontarians or Canadians what the operational problems are with getting tests done. Is it staff? Is it technology? Uh, is it information systems? What is it? When is it going to be fixed? And why isn't it fixed now? That's what I want to know. Would the asymptomatic testing, though, if you move it to alternate sites as opposed to the testing centers, at least reduce the stress and strain there, reduce the lines? Because when you see these stories of seven, eight-hour waits, people are just not going to get in the line, right? They're not going to get tested if it becomes impossible for them to manage school and work and all of these other things. So, I mean, is there not at least some kind of a benefit from that? Well, I think that instead of everybody who wants a test who gets a test, it should be everyone who needs a test gets a test. But the, the Ontario government has mandated that visitors and caregivers and support workers for long-term care residents need to be tested every two weeks mm -hmm. to, to maintain their ability to see those people. That's That'll account for 16,000 tests a day just for those individuals, people who are asymptomatic awaiting elective surgery. 
and many hospitals require tests. So there's a baseline level of demand that probably can't be met. And there's the variable demand related to outbreaks and people going back to work that must be met. And uh, like Minister Haidu said, if contact tracers can't do their job, if it takes seven days to get a test result, which becomes a, you know, a positive feedback loop for more spread in the community, eventually we'll lose control of this because we don't know where the virus is and the epidemiological links between cases are only known in about 50% 50, 50 of cases. So we're really flying blind. Okay, so the province is trying to up the testing capacity. It's about 35,000, as you said. They want to get it up to 50,000 uh, 50, excuse me, tests per day is what they've said. But also, Minister Haidu said they hope to have a surge capacity of maybe 78,000. Given the pace of the increase in testing capacity, how quickly do you think we could possibly hit those targets? Well, I, I think aspiring to 50,000 doesn't really matter to me. I, I, it's execution that matters. So talk to me when we have 50,000 tests a day and uh, and let me know what the plan is for 100,000 tests a day. Because saying we'll be at a number doesn't mean anything, uh, especially when people are standing in line uh, for hours and hours, not able to work, not able to have their kids in school, when this was entirely predictable. I need to know what the plan is. Saying that a number is going to be a number uh, really doesn't mean anything. Uh, and I think that, like Minister Heidi said, we need to explore new technologies for rapid turnaround tests and understanding that the tests have to provide effective information. But I think, uh, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good, as Voltaire said, I think. So it may not be as perfect as we want to be, but if people can be tested multiple times using perhaps imperfect technology, we may be able to get effective results uh, you know, if they can be tested quickly with rapid turnaround times. So is Health Canada moving too slow on that? I mean, we've seen this in other countries with mixed results and, and, and not a great level of of, of precision with some of the tests, but should Health Canada push this through and get this going and maybe flood the zone with, with, uh, with these tests, even if they aren't as perfect as they want it to be? Right. I'm not an expert on testing or on regulations, but I'll say that there's no more important issue in this country than fixing the testing problem. Everything stems from this. So I, I assume that the full resources of the federal government are focused on this and all the scientists who are capable and willing are tasked with this. Because just like when I was on the show in March when PPE was the issue, now it's testing. And if this doesn't get fixed, we're in major trouble. British Columbia has announced that it's doing what they call a swish and gargle testing method for kids. Uh, should that be expanded to other provinces or is, is that outside your scope of expertise, doctor? Well, I took my own son to a testing center yesterday along with me, and uh, he's eight years old. He did a great job with the nasopharyngeal swab, but I can say for other kids, friends of ours, they had to hold their kid uh, between their, the, the head of their kid between their hands to get them to do the test. I think anything that makes it easier for kids to be tested that's safe and effective should be, uh, should be available uh, rapidly, especially with school reopening and kids lining up at assessment centers to get tested so they can get back to school. You said the number one priority has to be to increased testing, but what about fixing some of the behavioral problems we've seen, right? If you look at the need to crack down on the gatherings, the, the contact tracing is telling us that pretty reckless behavior is the cause of some of these outbreaks in the 20 to 39 cohort. The, the crackdown on, and big fines on gatherings, is, is that enough by the provincial government? Do they need to roll back some of the things that have been open as Bonnie Henry has done, for example, in British Columbia? I, I mean, what more does Ontario need to do here? So personal responsibility is really important, and I agree with that message from uh, Premier Ford that you know we're all in this together, and it's not time to screw around. We have to take this seriously. But to have different rules for different venues, like a banquet hall versus your own personal home, is nonsensical. We need to roll back gatherings in high-risk activities like strip clubs, perhaps gyms, indoor dining. Uh, I think going to a store with a mask on should be fine, but we need to make sure that we're doing things in a smart way. What we're trying to do is avoid closing schools. That should be the last thing we close because the economy will fall apart if we close schools because parents won't be able to work and kids will be hurt. So we need to roll back everything else that's high risk for transmission. Keeping in mind, David, that we don't know the epidemiological link in transmission for about 50% of cases in Ontario. So to say that it isn't these weddings or that it isn't these banquet halls, I don't know how people can say that when we simply do not have the data. Okay, Dr. Michael Warner, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That's Dr. Michael Warner, a critical care physician at Michael Guerin Hospital. He joined us from Toronto. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.